because then I'll just stay in bed and I'll probably go back to the clinic again because I've also got a nasty bite here on my neck of some type. And I'm just wondering if some animal bit me or insect. So, all right. Let me kind of go through, I'm recording this. Let me just kind of go through these slides again. I think I've gone through these slides. For some reason, I feel like I've, I've gone through these slides. Have, have I gone through the slides on the analog to digital converters? No? Okay, then that was last semester in my mind is, as I said, that there, that, you know, I, again, I wasn't sure. I Part of me was telling me that I had not gone through them, but then all of a sudden I opened them up, they look so familiar, and it's like, oh, maybe I just went through them the other day just reviewing for, for today's class that there. So, okay, what I'm going to talk about today basically is analog to digital converters right there. The 8051 has built into it multiple analog digital converters, well, one in particular, ours has got one, but it's got, it can have multiple inputs, and I'll explain that later here as we go through this here. There is one question on the final exam on analog to digital converters, so, I mean, I don't remember if it's a full 20-point question or if it's half of a 20-point question, but at least 10 points on the final exam is coming out of this lecture, so that there. You know, as, as I'm nearing the end of the semester, I'm picking up lectures that I know are on the final exam and making sure that they're covered, that they're in there. So, all right, well, welcome. Is that cool? Right there. Okay, that there. So, what is an analog digital converter? That there, basically, and there'll be another part of this that there, but that there, but again, what we're looking at is it's, you know, we have, Multiple questions to answer on, on this here is that we've got, you know, analog goes in, it can be single ended or differential inputs, it can be unipolar or bipolar, there's all kinds of different analog digital converters questions. I'm not going to hold you responsible for all of that there. There are some things that I need to explain a little bit that, that there. So uh, we'll just kind of go through, through through these right here. Ah, there we are. A few, few people are coming in. All right. This is the transfer function for, and, you, and I'm sure you've heard the term transfer function before in your other courses. Out there. And it's already early in the morning. My voice is gone already. So you can tell that, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, you guys were there Monday when, when I came in. I'm not as red as I was. Monday I was beat red, wasn't I? That there, at least that's what Dr. Kyrell said as I was walking to class. He said that my face was was real red that there. So so that there. So I'm not quite as red, so I'm getting better, but I'm not still I'm still not healthy that there. But what we've got here is we start here at zero and we go to a maximum number. And n in this particular case is the number of bits in our A to D. So we can have a we can have a eight bit, a ten bit, or a twelve bit A to D with the eighty fifty one, right there. So when we read the port that there, when we read the analog to digital port, we're going to either read an eight bit, ten bit, or twelve bit number right there. And those numbers are in the special function registers. And we'll go through it. You know, I got a, a lab example that I tested and, and, and it did work yesterday. I brought my board with me to show versus making everyone do the lab. It's only, you know, it'd be kind of a 10 minute lab if we went in there and did it in the lab that there. It's fairly straightforward that there. But that there, ADC is, is, an, is an acronym for analog digital converter. If you see the term DAC, that's digital to analog converter. Um, I'm not sure if our 8051 has analog ports out. I don't think it does. Normally for analog out, we use pulse width modulation. And we talked about pulse width modulation earlier when I did the DC motor example. I showed a pulse width modulation, looks like, where I could vary the width of the pulse. Anybody remember the class where I brought the oscilloscope in and that there? I, I remember bringing the oscilloscope into the class and showing that as I vary the width, I increase or decrease the speed of the motor right there. So that there. But again, what, what we're doing is we're taking an analog voltage at the input and we're producing a digital number. Now this is a unipolar uh, single-ended 
transfer function. In other words, unipolar means it goes from zero to full scale. Bipolar means it can go from negative five to plus five or negative two to plus two. Right there. That's that there. And differential means that I have two inputs and I'm measuring the voltage between the two inputs. So you need to know the dip the, the definition. And let me just write those out here. Right here. Right here. When I talk about unipolar, unipolar means we're going from zero to full scale. Full scale in our particular case is 3.3 volts. But there's a pin that we specify as V reference and that specifies what full scale is. Bipolar means we go from negative full scale to plus full scale. Those are extremely rare in the analog to digital world, right there. When we look at single ended, single ended means that we're measuring the voltage from our VN with respect to ground. Zero volts or ground, right there. So in other words, we're measuring the absolute voltage with respect to ground. Double-ended or differential, differential is the normal term. Differential means we're measuring from V1 to V2. We have two input voltages and we're measuring the difference between the two of those right there. So those are some, some terms that you just need to know the definitions of right there. Right there. The most common is unipolar single-ended and that's the only thing I'm going to hold you responsible for. And those are the easiest ones to set up right there. If we're going differential, means that normally if we're using differential, is that we've got a relatively small voltage that's far away, and it's likely to have some noise on it, and we want to measure the um, voltage itself that there between the two two ends, and the, the noise is ignored, and that's similar to what you would have on differential instrumentation amplifier. Out there, I don't know. You probably have yet in your electronics courses. Have you talked about differential or uh, instrumentation amplifiers? Does anybody know what I mean by an instrumentation amplifier? Not there. Okay, well, an instrumentation amplifier is one that we have, say, for example, we have some sensor out here, and we have two wires. These two wires are run through together, usually as a twisted pair, and then they go to an amplifier that amplifies the difference between the two of those two ends right there. It's, called a differential amplifier that there and the whole idea is if there's noise on the line the noise is going to be the same on both wires that there so the noise does not get amplified just the signal itself and this could be for example a microphone you know the output of a electronic microphone say on your cell phone is very very small you know it's very very small that there it's down in the millivolt range and these fluorescent lights, for example, or these fans, they put out all kinds of electromagnetic noise out there. And if you don't use a differential amplifier, you'll hear a lot of what, the, you might very well hear 50 hertz hum. In the US, it's 60 hertz hum, but you will hear a low frequency hum coming from the, from the, the wiring to the lights right there. Because whenever you run electricity through a wire and the electricity changes, it sets up an expanding electromagnetic field that it collapses, expands, collapses right there. You know, if you study transformers, that's how transformers work. So these electric lights will create a nice nice hum. And I've had the pleasure of going to some people's homes that wired speakers in their ceiling, and they ran the wires over their light wires, and whenever they turn on the lights, all of a sudden they hear coming through, coming through their speakers. And that's the whole idea of a differential amplifier is that you don't amplify that hum. You know, that hum is pushed back. Up there. So when we get into this discussion here, most of what we're doing is going to be unipolar and single ended. There are applications where we want to use differential, and there's applications that where we want to use bipolar. Bipolar is fairly tricky with a microcontroller because you have to supply a negative voltage right there. Usually you would use some signal conditioning for that and that's beyond the scope of this course right there. Where you would actually raise the voltage up 
where it's above zero volt set there. So, that there. So, but what we're looking at right here is that here we're dealing with, and I, the reason I want to specify this, went back to that there, is because this particular slide is talking about a single-ended input between zero and full scale. Single-ended input, and it's unipolar right there. It's not bipolar right there. So it's a linear transfer function right there, which makes it very easy, and there will be a test question on the final exam where you're given a voltage and asked what the... Welcome, welcome, welcome up there. We started without you up there. So, okay. The um, transfer function is linear, which does make our math a lot easier when we want to analyze what our, what the bolt, what the actual voltage is. Yeah, this room's a little warm up there. You know, the young ladies were here first, so they took the cooler side of the room. That <laughs> there stuck the guys over here on the hot, on the in the warm side. I don't blame them. That's what I would do. That <laughs> there, that there. So okay, here again, what we're looking at. And this is getting a little bit beyond the scope of where I want to talk about in this class, but I just kind of want to point out here that when we analyze, take a, take a, this is an analog voltage here, and we're sampling it at particular periods of time, right there, right there. Normally, when we want to sample an analog voltage, we're either doing one of two things with it. One is we're using it for control applications, which is usually what we're going to use a microcontroller for. In other words, we're measuring the temperature in a room, and we want to tell whether or not we want to turn on the air conditioning. In this case, the answer is yes, we want to turn on the air conditioning. But the air conditioning does work, so hmm, that there. But regardless, uh, that's not the, the question. In which case, the time between the samples doesn't really matter that much. If we're measuring, for example, the speed of a car, you know, we can adjust the speed of the car whenever we want, right there. The, there's other times when we sample analog voltages where we want to try to recover the analog voltage in its original form. An example of that is music. You know, your favorite musician, whoever it might be, you know, everyone's favorite right now seems to be Prince, you know, out there since he just passed away, but Prince is my homeboy, so I, so I mean, he grew up in the same city I did, so that there's, so, so I like Prince. Plus, he got in trouble for painting his house purple, that there, no one's ever heard that story probably here, but Prince uh, is a huge Minnesota Vikings fan, just like I am from Minnesota, you know, that there, and he bought a house in Minnetonka, which is a very high-end suburb of Minneapolis, that there. And when we're talking high end, we're talking Damazara or Mount Kiera. Only these are giant mansions. You know, they're four or five bedroom, ten bedroom bungalows. You know, as you would call them, but they're, they're you know with half acre of land around the lake, you know, Lake Minnetonka. And he bought this beautiful mansion, and then he painted it this shade of purple, <laughs> right there. And everybody else's mansion was brown or white or whatever. But he painted his mansion bright purple that there, and the whole neighborhood neighborhood got almost revolted and tried to get him, you know, fine that there there was no law saying he couldn't do it, so he did. You know, later he bought Peaslee Park, and that's his whole. I don't know if he painted Peaslee Park purple or not, but that there. But Prince is quite a character that there, so I don't know that there. But regardless, when you when somebody records music in a sound studio, right there. I don't care whether they're playing guitar, whether they're singing, or even me giving this lecture with my bad voice right now up there. It, it's, it's an analog signal right there. And when we sample analog voltages and we want to store them to play them back in analog form, we have to sample them at a uniform sampling rate up there. Otherwise, we can't restore them back right there. So if you look at CD quality sound, it's, it, you know, when we talk about a CD, which I know CDs have become obs obsolete, but CD quality sound is considered the best quality recorded music out there. That's recorded, that's sampled at 44,000 samples per second right there. There's a rule 
that they're you're not required to know it for this class, but you know, you know, if you took a course from me in digital signal processing, you, you will know that you would know that rule. It's called the Nyquist theorem that says that you have to sample at least twice the highest frequency that's present in the signal. Not what you're interested in hearing, but as present that there. So we normally low pass filter the signal before we sample it right there. And that's done in the analog world before we go digital, not there. So the sampling frequency makes a difference. And if you're going to be doing that there, if you're going to be trying to restore this back, you have to make sure you sample at very precise time intervals. Thus, you use a crystal oscillator and you use one of the timers to, to generate the samples that there. You use you know, the, the, the timer function, timer two or three, and you would tell it that every you know, 10,000 times a second, grab a sample. 10,000, if you're looking at audio, 10,000 times a second is too low. The, the lowest audio, actually, no, I, I take that back. Uh, when we look at telephone quality speech, that there, you know, that there. When I talk about telephone quality, that's what you get when you pick up your household phone and you call, that there. That's actually sampled at eight kilohertz, right there. You know, telephone quality at there. And they will pass filter that down to 3,000 hertz. The human ear can hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, roughly. You know, that's at the age of 22, 23. You guys can all hear that well, but there. Me, myself, you know, I spent five years in the Army Reserves in a mortar platoon, you know, around big guns that make loud noises. That there, I was actually I was the fire direction control chief, which meant I didn't actually fire the guns. I was a half mile away from the guns, telling them which way to point the guns. That there, but uh, I was close enough to the guns that my ears would hear the loud booms. That there, and then you know, before that, many years listening to hard, heavy hard rock music. I grew up during the uh, Black Sabbath and uh, Grand Funk Railroad days, so I listened to some louder music than what's currently the, the mainstay today. So my ears probably hear up to about 12,000 hertz that there. And as people get older, you know, they're hearing, you know, the upper end tends to go first that there. And that has to do, do, it, do with the way the ear is functioning. The, you know, the ear is made of a lot of tiny little hairs that vibrate, that resonate the different frequencies. And the higher frequencies equate to the shorter hairs, and they tend to get stiffer as people get older. So the higher frequencies tend to go away before the lower frequencies go away as people age. That there, but the phone, as it turns out, bandwidth is down to three kilohertz. That there, if you try to play a City or Elisa CD through a household phone, it's not going to sound very good. Right there because all the quality of music is in the upper frequencies. You can recognize the song, you can recognize, you might recognize that it's sitting or Lucy, you might not. You know, I always tell the story that there, and I hopefully I didn't tell this class. Yeah, you know, my ex-wife and her sister were about a year apart from each other. And they both had the same type of way of talking. They were both rude and obnoxious. You know, maybe that's why she's next, right? That there. But, you know, if, if she was, you know, grew up in, they both grew up in Joe Hoare and that there. And this was about 20 years ago when I was married married to her. She, I, I, there was one incident where I was driving to work and my mother-in-law, my, my wife's mother, spent the night with us in, in Bonsar. I lived in Bonsar at the time. And... I, we were getting ready to move back to the States, and I took my wife at the time to work. She worked in Shalom, and I was working at, at Kajang at, at Uniten at the time, out there. So I took my wife to work at, at Shalom, and then dropped her mother off at Suban Jaya at my sister-in-law's house. Out there. Well, my sister-in-law wasn't home. She was at work, so I just dropped her off, made sure she got in the house, and then I went on to work. Out there. That's not, you know, now the crutch of the story is, I'm on the north-south highway getting ready to get off at Kajak out there, and I get a phone call. I pick up the phone, and it was like my wife or her sister, normal conversation, no hello, I'll come. it's like, I pick up the phone, where are you? 
did, did you drop mom off? Yeah, I'm getting ready to get off the highway. I'm almost to work. Okay, did you drop mom off? Yes. Click. The conversation's over with. As I said, you know, there's a reason that she might be an ex. You know, that was a normal conversation with her, you know. Short to the point, hang up, you know, that there. The phone rings 30 seconds later. Where are you? I'm, I'm on the exit at Kajak. Did you drop mom off? Yes. Who is this? It's your wife, don't you know? I said, didn't we just have this conversation 15 seconds ago? Oh, that must have been Ayan. And click, it hangs up again. That there. So the, the point that I was trying to get across here is that if the two people were in front of me and I had the entire 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz audio frequency range, I could tell the two of them apart. That there. But because we were talking on the phone and the band with was limited down to three kilohertz, I couldn't tell the two of them apart. Now normally, you know, you know, young ladies, if you have a boyfriend they call, you probably recognize your boyfriend because you might only have one, right? You know, preferably it's the same thing with the guys. The guys are more likely to have two or three floating around. We know how we, we know how men are, right? That there. But the, the, the point is is that you normally when the phone rings, you can tell the person who's who's calling because you normally would have only that kind of conversation with that person. But because I was dealing with two people with similar personalities and similar enough voice patterns and similar enough accents that I could not tell the two of them apart over the phone. That there. You know, I've known a lot of young men to get in trouble in the US. They'd call their girlfriend's house, their mother would answer, and they didn't recognize that they were talking to the mother and not the daughter for the same reason that there. And some of those guys had some very inappropriate conversations at there, so at there. But you know, but getting back to this whole discussion, the when we're dealing with audio signals, that there, the time between samples is critical. Because if the time varies between samples, the signal will get distorted and will not sound like the original analog signal back there. If we're dealing with control applications, and we're trying to control the speed of a motor, we're trying to control the temperature in the room, we're trying to control the level of alcohol in a chemical bath, we're trying to control the color of paint, pigment on a paint using an optical sensor, that they're trying to control the light in the room. Frequency, the time between samples is not as critical. So, so you, you have to look at that there. So we look at that their input is continuous where the output is a series of discrete time points right there. The time between these points may matter or it may not matter. It depends on the application. If you're dealing with audio or video, it definitely matters. Not there. Because you're going, you're going to want to reconstruct the original signal. But if you're just if you're doing a control application where you're trying to control the temperature of an oven, you know, I keep throwing all these applications out of control, then it doesn't matter if you adjust the, the heating element 100 times a second or 5 times a second. You still control, control the oven that there. But it's only when you're dealing with analog signals that you want to reconstruct that the time matters between samples. That there. And that there. So, okay. Now we're getting into a little bit more that there. The ADC input range is defined by the reference voltage provided by the ADC. That's a, we have a choice of multiple pins to use for our reference voltage. That's our full scale. <coughs> if we're using, if we're using um, unipolar, which is the only thing I'm talking about today, then it's going to go from zero volts to whatever B reference is. Now, in most cases, if we're dealing with the 8051, we're going to set BDD as B reference, so that's 3.3 volts. But we can supply a different B reference if we want. In other words, we could go from zero to two volts, for example, right there. And we put two volts on here. I don't know if this particular chip, I think it's five, I don't think it'll take five volts. I think 3.3 is the max. That there, so their power supply is ADC. Input voltages outside the rails cannot be measured. Yeah, this is right. This is what I was just think, talking, thinking in my mind right there. This answered the question. I should have read the read, read that there. In most ADC architectures, input voltages outside the supply rails 
cannot be measured and may cause damage. So if I try to put B-reference at five volts, that's outside the rails of the analog digital conversion. So, right there. So this is kind of a single-ended right there. This is what they're showing, is what we've got here. This is our reference voltage right there. That goes to, to our ADC. This is the voltage we want to measure right there. Notice that this is showing as an AC voltage, which it's not really AC, it's a ground reference input voltage that there. They probably shouldn't use AC. They probably should use the symbol here, a very DC voltage right there. The reason I say is because we're using ground as our second reference right there. Right there. So our reference is between zero and ground. If we have an AC voltage right here, we would have to shift it to where it's like this right here, over the ground right there. And we can do that easy enough by putting it into a summing amplifier right there. And then an or a op amp with a, uh, you know, a 1.6 volt offset right there. We could easily shift that up to where it's between zero and 3.3 volts right there. So, but this is the typical here, and this is our digital output right there, right there. So this is a typical signal right there. So common problem, the input circuitry maximum output is higher than B reference, in which case we have to limit it down. Another problem is that the input signal is too low and we don't use enough of our, you know, that's where we may have to amplify it. We normally have to do some kind of signal conditioning before we that there. I'm not going to go into the signal conditioning circuits because that's an analog, digital, or electronics problem, not so much of a microcontroller problem. My phone's getting warm, which is, seems to be a problem with all cell phones anymore. They tend to get warm when they, they're searching for a, for a Wi-Fi connection up there. So, but uh, getting back to this here, that um, up there, you know, what... <laughs> The signal conditioning is actually, you have a problem where you've got an analog input, it's between negative 0.5 volts to 0.5 volts, and you want to measure that voltage between 0 and 3.3 volts. You have to shift it and then you have to amplify it. Sometimes you have to, you also have to do the low pass filtering that I talked about. There's all kinds of signal conditioning that has to occur in the analog world before it's moved to the digital world right there. And that's an entire three, four week section of, of an electronics course. After it's not part of this course. So we will assume for sake of discussion that anything we're going to sample is going to be between zero and B reference right there. So right there. So this is just showing one way that you can do the signal condition. You just put it through a you know put it through a potentiometer or or a voltage divider network right there. This is, a, just, this is using a voltage divider that simply divides voltage in half is all it does right there. Right there. And again, I'm not going to here. This is what you see typically when we look at a differential. Here is our offset to put it above ground right there. Right there. We're just, put, you know, we're just putting you know, 1.6 volt battery there, 1.65 volt battery there, or we can use the summing amplifier. Most of the time you use the summing amplifier. This method, it really isn't very clean, just sticking that between, but I have seen people do it and get away with it up there, up there. But what we're measuring here is just the, this voltage here between the two of those. This is the differential input right there. Signal, we still have our reference right there, that's the same. We still have our output right there. And our output is just, again, it's going to be the difference between our analog plus minus our analog in right there. Okay, what did I do? Right there. That's what we're going to, that's what we're actually measuring with this particular case. And typically, if we have this type of signal, we're normally going to run it through some signal conditioning because we're going to amplify it. Because typically, this is a very small quantity down in the millivolt range, we're also going to run it through an amplifier. So this this circuit right here, this whole thing right here, is actually just a simplification of a much more complex circuit that you would use. All the only thing I want to get out of this here is the differential is that we're 
Well, we're going to measure the difference between two voltages right there. Where the signal ended right here, we're measuring just the input voltage right there. Right there. So again, this goes through and explains it in more detail. I'm gonna, I'll put these slides up later on, right there. So this is the differential bridge circuit, and I'm not going to go into bridge circuits. That there, a bridge circuit is typically used to measure very low, low changes in resistance. That there, a load cell or a strain gauge or a thermistor might be used in that there. Very commonly used in industrial applications. You know, if I want to measure, say, the deflection of a beam, I would place a strain gauge on there. A strain gauge is a resistor that looks like this here. As I bend this here, I, stre I, I stretch out the wires, which makes them thinner, makes them a little longer, makes it, makes it creates a small change in the resistance. If I bend it the other direction, I compress the wires, make them fatter, shorter, I reduce the resistance, so I can measure whether or not this beam is bending or not, flexing by, you know, by, by just simply, you know, measure, you know, placing this on that there. One of the jobs I had many years ago, I worked for a company called International Truck. Actually, at that time, it was International Truck. Harvester and Truck Corporation. They make these big 18-wheel trucks you see in the movies. They don't have them in Malaysia, but you know the great big American-style trucks that there. They make that. They make those trucks that there. And you know the the design center. I worked at the design center, and what I basically my job was to figure out how to measure the how much these truck chassis bend when they went over an obstacle course. So we would put the strain gauges on there. We had an analog recorder in, in the truck. We had a program that would, you know, would measure the resistance that continuously that there, and we could actually see exactly how much we were bending, you know, these beams, and we could make a prediction of how long that beam was going to last based on, you know, the, you know, the properties of the material. My job, I had nothing to do with calculating how long the beam was going to last. That was the mechanical engineer's job. My job was just simply to give them the pattern that, uh, you know, how much it was bending right there, right there. So, and that took me about three, it was a summer contract when I was first started teaching that there, I, I worked on that project. And the job was just basically to figure out how to get the analog. International truck at that time didn't have any electrical engineers or computer engineers, all they had was mechanical engineers. So they had to bring in someone outside to, figure, to get the data in. You know, once they got the data, they knew what to do with it that there. So I don't, claim to know anything about stress analysis on truck chassis, but I know how to measure it <laughs> right there. And, and that was what my job was, is figuring out how to measure it that there. And again, we used this, I used a circuit very similar to this with an analog digital converter that there and a small laptop computer that sat in the back of the, you know, you know back of the truck that would actually would be wired into these various gauges and by a little big box of analog circuitry that there would they go into the A to D's that then would feed into the you know the, into the computer and then at the end of the ship the drive I would simply hand a floppy disk. This that tells you how old it was, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk or a tape to the engineer and he would sit there and bring it up into a into a spreadsheet and we could actually see the you know how it bended right there. But what we were measuring is the voltage between here and here right there. And we had two bulge dividers here that there, and we would come up that there, the bulge interest is across the bridge, and those were all, that's almost always a differential input to the A to D, because that change in bulge is very small right there. And it would also go through quite a bit of analog amplifier that there. There was a lot of analog electronics in this that there. The actual digital part was easy this particular case right there. So, okay, the range right here, this formula right there, right there, and this formula right here, know those two formulas, hint, hint, hint. 
you will have a problem that will say for a single ended 12 volt ADC use a 2.4 volt reference right there. I give you, you know, for example, what is the right there, least significant bit. This is all oh, this is the change. That's not the term that I'm looking for right here. You will see a problem that would look like this right there. B reference equals 3.3 volts and it's getting a little warm I may I may continue this next week actually the way I'm feeling that but we'll go ahead B reference is that N equals 12 bits in other words this is a 12 bit A to D if and, and I'm just going to say uh, ADC Zero equals, and this is high and low, right there. It's, it's 12 bits, so it's going to be two registers, high and low, right there. Equals, and I'm going to say four, six, three, three, X, right there. VN equals what, right there? That's the type of question you're going to see, right there. Now, that's fairly straightforward, right there, because you're going to simply look at that B max, this is 12 bits, B max is going to be F, 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 right there. 12 bits, right there, is at there. So, Vn is equal to 3.3 volts times 436 over F, 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 right there. It's a linear relationship, right there. So, I don't know if my calculator here will do that. You may have to convert that programmer. Oh, it's got to divide, so let's put this in hex. And we what did we say that was? 436? 463? Divide by FFF equals. Oh, no, no, that doesn't work. You can't do it that way. So, so you're going to have to put it in and then convert back over. So FFF is... 4095 decimal right there. That's real easy. And what did I say? 463 was it? 463. That's clear. 463 is 1123. So we go back here. Scientific. 1143 was it? What's that? 1123? All right, well, if, I, if I get that there, 1123 divided by 4095 equals times 3.3, that's going to give me 0.9 volts, roughly, right there. But that's the formula you, you, you would have to do is, you know, this calculator won't do the math in, in, in hex. And I don't think the Texas Instruments, you know, your calculators do, you have to convert it over to base 10 and then just do the math out there. So, but that's the basic rule right here. Looking at this here, 463, again, let me see what I had there before. So, 463, now, oh, we're, we're 1123, yeah, that's what I, I have it right, right? 1123, right there. And anything that's 12 bits is going to be 4095. Anything that's 8 bits is going to be 256. Anything that's 10 bits is... Two raised to the 10th power is going to be 1124, or 1123. So, the formula given, oh, wrong, wrong, wrong class. We want uh, this one. We want the PowerPoint right there. Right there. The formula given, <coughs> right there, B reference, and this uses 
2 to the n, it's actually 2 to, two to the n minus 1. That formula is off by a, by a very small amount, not enough to change your grade on a final exam, so don't worry about it. You can use that formula right there because full scale is 2 to the n minus 1. Not n minus 1, but 2 to the n minus 1 right there. So in other words, if n is 12, then 2 to the n is 4096, but the, but full scale, the highest number you can represent is 4095. You you can use this formula, or you can or you can do this subtract one. It does. The the more accurate is the minus one, but you you have an error of less than one percent. So, is it significant? It, it's not significant. You got to remember one of the things. Up there, and if Dr. Kyrell or anybody from EAC listens to this, I don't care. But you have to realize, as engineers, that you, you deal with the real world and you do calculations that are plus or minus 15 decimal points. You're dealing with equipment that's plus or minus one or two decimal points at best. You're dealing with components that are plus or minus anywhere from 5% for quality components to 20% for standard components off the shelf. So if you use a number that's one off when you're dealing with, if I multiply this times 4096 or 4095, the error is so small that you would never see it in real life. So that's why a lot of times you'll see a lot of these formulas if they're written by experienced engineers, they tend to get simplified a little bit. They tend to, they're not the actual formula that if you went through the derivations work, you would actually get, get. They're actually kind of simplified a little bit because, yes, it's more accurate if I wrote this formula right here as B in over B reference times two to the N minus one right there. That formula is, a little bit more accurate back there. But if that went away, what difference does it make? Because 2 to the n is anywhere from 124, what did I say the other one was? 256 for 8-bit and 4090, 4096 for 12-bit, right? This is 10, 8, and 12-bits right there. You know, the least the least one, accurate one, is the 8-bit, and you're still off less than half of 1%. You know, your error is less than half of 1%. I can almost guarantee that the resistors you're using for the signal condition are probably plus or minus 10%. So the actual voltage that you're measuring is probably off 5% anyway, at best. So the fact that, you're, that this formula is a little bit off is not important. That there. So you just use these formulas right there. You might see me use the 4095 simply because I'm used to using it that way, but that there. So, but that, but basically those are the, I, I point out these two formulas, and I did that example because you will see a question where I will give you a number and I'm going to ask you what the volt, voltage in is. And then I'm going to give you another question where I'm going to say this is the this is what I measured what is the voltage right there so these two right here this gives you the number out right there right there what you would measure right there this gives you the voltage the other way around and they're just re reverses of the same formula right there this is taking what we measure you know that's what we measured in in the port we're dividing it by 2 to the n and multiplying it by v reference, and that gives us the voltage that we measured. That's what I just did. This here, we, we have a voltage, we measure it, what do we expect to see in, when we read the port? And I'm going to do the example at the end here. Right there. So, right there. And they get in this coding here, and again, we're looking here at these codings here. Again, here they're showing equal, greater than or equal to v reference, we get 4095. Not 4096, but 4095. So here they're using the minus the one right there. 
here. This is my input voltage right here. This is saying that if we have V reference minus one LSB, we're going to get 4095. Half, we're going to get half of that. Fourth, we're going to get this. In other words, these are, this is what you would expect to get right there. So in other words, if our reference voltage is 3.3 volts, if our input voltage is 1.65, then we're going to get around 1020, 20, 2048 that's it. Bipolar, I'm going to skip that there. Recap. That there. Now, a couple of things that there. You will be asked how we can measure 50 or 16 or 8 analog voltages when we only have one A to D. So you have to realize that there is an analog multiplexer, 8 channel and 9 channel analog multiplexer right there. This is what's on the F020. It's not necessarily what's on the 850, but it's pretty close. We've got two 12-bit A to Ds. I think ours has only got one. We do have an 8-bit and a 12-bit A to D right there. Our 12-bit A to D is fed through the multiplexer. We have a couple of analog comparators. We have a voltage reference right there that we can program. We have a temperature sensor that we can measure the temperature of the chip right there. <clears throat> but this is what, these are the analog input components on that there. Now, one of the other questions that you may or may not be on there, I don't remember, is you need to know what's meant by a successive approximation A to D right there. And this is what's inside of a typical A to D, the A to D. And how am I on time right there? I just want to see the time situation. Right there. Oh, I got some time right there. Yeah, I'm still feeling well enough I can continue with that there. All right. In this particular case, what we've got here, this is a 9 to 1 analog MUX right here. This is the 9 to 1 analog MUX right there. So... It's got eight analog inputs that there. Now these eight analog inputs are tied to the outside world by using the crossbar right there. So the crossbar is used to tie them to the analog world or to the outside world. Internally, so we have to tell this what pins we want these to be connected to right there. So we also have to tell, we have this register here called the AM MUX select that tells the MUX what analog voltage we want to measure. We could have up to eight analog inputs plus the temperature sensor. The, the temperature sensor is also an analog input to the MUX right there. Right there. We also have some information here on the control where we can tell this whether or not we want to do some amplification, whether it's a double-ended or single-ended, that there. So we have to control those things right there. So these are all part of the special function registers right there. Here. Now we also have going into it right here, we have ADC0, where we can tell it by writing a one to it to take do it to a conversion. That there, that's software control. We also have timer two and timer three inputs overflow where we can control this with the timers. Now remember earlier I went into this long discussion where I got in my sister-in-law and my wife's phone where I talked about you know, set, you know where we have to do uniform sampling, that's where the timers come in, right there, that, that there. We, but we can also do a manual overflow right there where we, where we can tell it, or a, a manual start, where we just say, take a sample, right there. And we do that just by writing ADC0 does equal one right there. You know, again, that's a special function register. And then coming out of this here, we have our ADC window interrupt right here. This is our interrupt saying that we have a conversion completed right there. So we can, so the, the AD will generate an a interrupt saying that we've finished our conversion right there. So normally if we're going to use this with a timer, we will use the timer to start the A to D and then we'll use the interrupt from the A to D to stop the software and, and process the sample right there. So 
Then we also have our ADC zero, our, our registers that come out of that there. And then of course our system clock and our reference. Now we need to do a clock. The way that this thing actually works, it's kind of a funny deal right there. And it's important that you kind of understand the way it works is this does what they call a successive approximation. It does what's called a binary search looking for the right value right there. And when it does that, what it means is it's going to start at the middle. If this is a 12-bit A to D, it's going to start looking at 1.65 volts, and it's going to say, all right, am I high or low? If I'm high, then I go and I look at half of that, you know, point, uh, eight two five volts or whatever, half of uh, 1.65 is right there. And then if I'm higher low, and I keep guessing until I get to the right value right there. It's kind of like, I'm gonna guess somebody's age that they're, and the person's not in front of me, so, but that person's between the age of zero and 50, right? So I'm gonna guess, you know, you know, Joe Smith's age. I'm picking Joe Smith out of that there. And when I want to select Joe, pick Joe Smith's age, I know he's between age one and 50 right there. What's the fastest way to get there in the fewest number of guesses? Well, for, and the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say a number and the person would come back and say high or low right there. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to say 25. Up, oh, you're high. Then I'm going to say 12. Up your low. So then I'm going to go halfway between 12 and 25. That's going to be, that's eight, excuse me, eight. Uh, um, now I'm getting to the point that eight plus five is what, 13. So I'm going to add half of that. So I'm going to say, well, I'm just going to say 19 at that point. Up your low. So then I'm going to say, all right, 15. You're, you're, you're high. So now I'm going to say, 13 or 14, right? Because it's either 13 or 14. It's one of those two. But I've, I've narrowed it down in one, two, three, four, five or six guesses. Look at that there. That's much faster than trying to start at zero and count up and then when, I get, you know, when I'm done right there. Because the other type is, is where we use a counter and we start at zero and we count up to... 4095, and when I get to the right place, I stop right there. As soon as my my uh, comparator stops or flips, then I know I found the right right value. So we use excessive approximation, and what excessive approximation means is we guess high or low right there. And what the way that this works is that I've got my analog signal here. It's going to a comparator right here. And this comparator here, and this is an output of a digital to analog converter right there. Right there. And this is my guess going into here. If I guess too high, then this is going to be a one or a zero. If I guess too low, it's going to be a high right there. It doesn't matter which one it is that there. So, but the output is this converter is either one or zero. If it's a one, I've guessed too high. If it's a zero, I've guessed too low or the other way around. So one way of doing this is to just count from one and go up to 40, 96, 95 right there. Start at zero and count that there. If you do that, it's going to take you typically about half the number of guesses each time, or 20, 48 guesses. You know, tries to do that. If you use a success approximation, then you're going to get it in probably eight or nine guesses at most. So successive approximation is much faster. So what this does, this would start at 2048, and then it would decide whether it wants to go to 1024, or if it wants to go up to, uh, I want to say, uh, now I'm really going bad. It's going to go, say, 30, 50, something, or whatever, right there. You know, my, my math, my basic math skills with this headache is coming on, is going, is disappearing right there. But again, it's going to go, and I think my screen is starting to, what's my, oh, uh, uh, okay, it's on, 
my battery's on the 21%. That's why my screen all of a sudden, you didn't see it, but my screen went dark right there. That's telling me class is going to be coming to an end here before too long. I got 20 minutes, which is plenty of time to finish it. But successive approximation is basically you're doing guesses based on high or low right there. And I know that I've asked in this class in the past, and maybe on your test, explain how excessive approximation works. And what I'm looking for is you can use the age example, where you start in the middle and then you split the difference each time, right there. So kind of like haggling over a fake Rolex on the tie on the street, right? Up there. They always ask you double the price that they'll settle for, right? Normally, right? Or usually about four times the price they'll settle for. But you start, you know, you start, you know, you start off with a guess, then you split the difference. You know, you know it's, you know, it's too high or too low, and then you split the difference until you finally narrow in on the right one right there. So, again, the example I gave, which is a good one, you know, an age between zero and a hundred. I start off, I guess, fifty. I, then I guess twenty-five. Then I guess twelve. And then I guess eighteen. And then I, you know, now I know it's between 12 and 18. So then I'm going to guess, say at this point, 14 or whatever, until I narrow down. That's much quicker than starting at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You just keep guessing, and that's that's the principle that a successive approximation uses, right there. And that's the type of A to D this is is successive successive approximation right there. The, you know, the, the rest of this right here, I don't really worry about too much right there. So, this is how we started. There's four ways of starting it right there. Right there, one is an external signal, conversion start. Again, that has to be set up by the, by the, um, oh, geez, the, uh, the uh, crossbar. You know, that there, the crossbar has to, you have to enable convert start pin. That there, that's an input pin that goes A to D. You have to enable that. You can write to the special function register bit ADC0, busy. That is a special function register, a bit in the special function register. Or we can set it up to use either timer two or timer three, right there. But there it remains and it's restores to zero. When, we, when the conversion is done, we can tell it's done by two ways ADC0. Busy goes low, that tells it that it's done, or the ADC0 interrupt flag gets triggered high. We have two ways of telling it. We can enable this flag right there, is it, if it's enabled, then the interrupt will be generated right there. So, and I'm nearing the end that there, this, this kind of shows the map, you know, again, you know, it's a 12 bit, so we can either right justify or left justify it however we want. This gives us our code again, what we're talking about. We can't have the gain that there, we're just using gains of one. We can't have it multiply the gain that there. Again, these are the same formulas right there. Right there. You know, that I gave earlier right there. So, right there. Programming, I'm just going to go through the example. I think I'm just going to. I think I've covered, you know, I don't want to get into all this too much because as in other sections of this class, if it's very specific to this processor, I don't want to cover great detail because the odds of you using a Silicon Labs 8051 processor for a project is minimal right there. You might use a PIC, you might use an ARM, you might use an 8051, but it may not be a Silicon Labs all these special function registers are unique to Silicon Labs. And having you spend a lot of time memorizing something that you probably never use is not worth the time. If you do have to use it, you look it up in the data book. That there, you know, that there. So, you know, you, you, if, if, you, if you find yourself doing a project where you have to use an analog to digital converter with an 8051 or an ARM processor or an Arduino, you pull the data book up and you read how to do it with that processor. You learn the basics here, how it works, what it does, but that particular processor you have to learn at the time you, you're going to use it. Because next month, Silicon Labs might change the architecture, and 
<laughs> come up with a new generation of processors and this is all garbage. They may discontinue the 8051 and go strictly with their ARM processors. We don't know. So, but the conversion frequency, don't worry about that. Just take the default typically. At their, because again, this conversion clock frequency is how often it's going to change, make its guesses is what that does. In other words, in this particular case, conversion clock has 2.5 megahertz, so you have to have the system clock has to be fast enough to do the guessing right there. So our conversion clock has maximum frequency. That's how fast we can sample at, 2.5 mega samples per second. That's a lot of samples out there. I don't think you, you can't keep up that fast out there. I'm going to skip all this. This is all the registers at their polling method, detecting at their. Okay, I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to run a short little sample here, right there. Disregard, I mean, they've got a whole bunch more slides here that are going through interrupt methods, right there. There's a group of group more slides. I'm going to skip those. And what I want to, I mean, right there. I was encoding a lecture for yesterday's class, so <laughs> robotics class. Right there. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I've got a program, it's actually one that they supplied, but uh, I modified it to work with this particular processor right there. Yeah, okay. No. Nope. Yeah, washing machine in there for some reason, okay. This is a short little sample program. It might say that it's using a different processor. I didn't, I'm terrible for change, for Oh, okay, it's the right one that there. I changed it right there. But this particular one that there, you can see it's a fairly long program right there, but let me just kind of hit the highlights of it right there. If you look at the board, you're right here, you see there's a little potentiometer on here. Right there, there's a potentiometer on that there. And I should have. Where is it? I need to, before next semester, I need to clean up my computer. And you can see there's the potentiometer right there, right there. So, in this potentiometer, if you look at the schematic here someplace, goes to port 1.2 right there. It's right there. That, that's where the potentiometer goes to, is port 1.2, right there. So, and this goes between VDD and ground right there. So, now this code right here that I've got here, basically, all I want to do is just kind of show a, that there, this is got, that there, I've got an interrupt right there, and it's ADC zero, interrupt, and interrupt ADC zero, and the conversion right there. So I wrote a, it, I wrote an interrupt service routine for end of conversion right there. And my main program, all it does is right here, is I initialize the ports, I initialize timer two, and I initialize ADC, and I'm not gonna go through those in great detail. And then I enable the interrupts, and then I have a loop where I just do nothing. This does absolutely nothing at this point right there. Now, my system clock initialize right there, I'm just going to set the system clock right there to the 
to the default right there. My port initialize, I just, I set port 1.2 as an analog input right there. Right there. So port 1 mod is that I'm going to set this to as, as an analog input right there. And you can look that up in the data sheet, how that's done. Or you can use the uh, program that comes with the, the conversion wiz wizard. But you just set that. But I'm setting port 1.2 as, as the analog input. And I'm enabling the LED. I don't know why. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm using, even using the LED. I enable the crossbar right there, obviously, right there. My timer 2, I'm not going to go through that there. But I'm setting this thing up to, <coughs> to overflow at a certain rate right there. Again, this is going by, it looks like I'm setting it for 10 microseconds. I just copied this program, so I didn't go through great detail. It doesn't matter what you set that for. Now here's my analog, this is where the heart of things are. Right here, I initialize this. This is the code that I'm not going through because this is unique to this processor. You know, in order to do this, you have to look this up in the data sheet or use the configuration wizard and look this up. And that would be different for any processor you use but again, we're setting the, the SAR clock. I mentioned that what that is a few minutes ago. We, we disable that there and we trigger. We tell this that we're going to trigger on timer two overflows. And the actual command, you look up in the data sheet right there. We're going to tell it we have one X game, normal tracking mode, 10 bit mode. So we're operating 10 bit mode right here. Right there. 12 bit mode disabled. Low power disabled positive input right there. So we're using this as single ended right there, ground reference and our rep and our ground and 3.3 .3 is our that there and we're not using the temperature sensor right there and we enable that that there. So all these commands right there would come out of the configuration wizard or looking up the data sheet for how we want to configure this A to D. And I'm deliberately not wanting you to study this right there. I don't look at this particular routine that there. I'll put that there. Now, what is important is down here, this is the actual interrupt service routine. Now, this particular one right here, I've got the accumulator is equal to ADC0 accumulator minus minus, and when it equals zero, I'm going to take what I'm doing here is I'm taking 2,048 samples and I'm averaging them out in order to get the average right there. So, that there, and when I run the code, I'm gonna just put a breakpoint on this right here. Now, as it turns out, if I stop it here, I have to put use one more command there, and I'm just going to, at this point here, here I'm just gonna put another command in here. MB equals, MB plus one, MB equals MB minus one. And, and you wonder why I did that. And the only reason I did that is because I wanted breakpoints there. Boom, <laughs> right there. So I just comp compile that there. I'm gonna go ahead and stick this board in. And what I'm going to do here is connect download this right here. Now MB in this particular case, I'm doing the calculation right here. Right here. This is measurement is equal to, right there, is applied B reference, which is 3.3 volts, divide by, right there, our, our number of bits, the re results, right there, this is the results right there, divided by the number of bits, which is 1023 right here. So now notice that this one is using the minus one. You remember earlier I said that too. You know, the real formula is minus one, but the one in the slides, they ignored the minus one. So they use the minus one here, right there. But again, we're taking the result, and they're using, the output is in millivolts, not in volts, right there, because this is an integer processor. Right there, so it, so it can't tell me 3.3 volts, but it can tell me 3,300 millivolts right there. So that there, and I'm going to put a breakpoint in right here. And the reason I'm putting the breakpoint is, oh, guess what it did? It 
stripped out those two commands because they didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, the, our compiler is smart enough to say, I added one and subtracted one. Well, we don't need to do that, right? Right there. So I guess I guess I can't put in the breakpoints. I'm going to have to run it twice to get the right answer right there. So I'm going to go ahead and put a breakpoint here right there. And I'm going to also put a watch value in right here for millivolt. Right there. So millivolt right now is 256 right there. And I'm going to turn this all the way in one direction right here. And I'm going to run it twice right there. And notice that it's, it's 1023. I, right there. That doesn't look right. All right, that's zero. That's zero. Let's go all the way the other way. It should go to 3300. Why is it not? You can tell that, it, that, that as I turn the pot, the value is changing, but it's not changing correctly. The zero is correct. But this should go to 3,300 if it's set right. Evidently, there's something I screwed up that there. It's off by a factor right there. Times 3,300 divided by result. Let me see what result is. You know what? <coughs> Yeah, that's right. So, one thirty. It's not doing this calculation for some reason. Right there, result is equal to accumulator divided by. Right there. At there. Uh, let me look at one more thing here. As you as you can see here, you, you can look at the actual. And I'm, as I'm looking at ADC0 high and low, I got 03FF. 03FF. Yeah, it's 1023. That's, yeah, it's reading the right value right there. Right there. It's not doing this calculation for some reason. The result is equal to times that there. It's not giving me the right, this result. Result is equal to accumulator right there. But it's doing the right thing right there. That there, because as you as, as I move the pot, you know, toward the middle, right there's about the middle. You see it at four four eighty three. If I turn it all the way to one end, it's at zero. If I turn it all the all the way to the other end, it's ten twenty three. So you can see that I'm reading the analog voltage right there. Right there, it is reading the analog voltage. For whatever reason, my calculation is not right. Right there, because result in millivolt, it's not doing this calculation right. Because it's, it's supposed to be taking this times 3,300 divided by by 1023, and it's not doing that because. Because as you look at this result, the millivolt looks exactly, is the same number each time. So there's something funny going on. It's, you know what, let me delete these two lines. That might be screwing it up. Okay, let 
Let me just write one more time here. Yeah, now it's those, those that doing that plus minus one that broke the compiler for some reason because now it's giving me the right value. See, there's my 3300, and if I go the other direction, there's my zero. As I said, it takes two because it doesn't execute this line till the next that there, so I have to hit it twice. That's why I was trying to put a, a dummy line in there, a no op that, but the compiler stripped out my no op. <laughs> and when it stripped out the no op, it also stripped out that line too, right there. So it completely screwed everything up that there. So I have to that there. I need to have some kind of statement in here after that 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 there. But regardless, if I put this in the middle somewhere right around there, you see. There's my 20, 20, 29. So now it's working correctly. When I took took away that line set there. If I put it all the way to one end, there's my 3300 or 3.3 .3 volts. If I put it all the way to the other end, and again, I have to hit it twice to get the right value. I got zero. I put it just a little ways this way. There's 10 up there. That's about a third of the way. Right there, so that's 1.07 volts. In previous classes, if I had a voltmeter, I would put the voltmeter on here and try to measure the voltage. And you'll see that's pretty close, right there. So, but I'm actually measuring the voltage that there. So this is more of a demo type lab than it is, you know, to actually have you go into the lab and do this. It's, you know, it, would, it doesn't take. There isn't much because the code. There's nothing to wire. The code is here. All you're doing is, the only thing I could make you do in the lab is measure the voltage at the center, at the center of the pot and compare it to what's that there. It's just to see how accurate it is that there. And trust me, it's pretty doggone accurate. It, it really is that there. It's not super, super accurate, but you get a, there's my 3300 right there. So what was happening before when I had those two dummy lines in there that broke the, the compiler that there, it, it, it gave me garbage code. Once I took them out, it's not giving me the right answers right there. So and that's it for this discussion right there. And again, to point out.